me? Okay, how is the microphone now? Come on. <laughs> I trusted you guys in the <laughs> Can I tell from here? Okay, so um, examples of network data um, are absolutely everywhere. Um, everybody, of course, can think of social media. Everybody imagines a friendship network, and that's a common example uh, where your nodes are users and edges are friends or followers or whatever thing that social network has. But it happens in many other places, and it happens in the sciences. In ecology, people use networks to study ecosystems. Um, predator-prey relationships, those are networks. Um, in biology, networks are everywhere, regulatory networks of genes and proteins and so on. In neuroscience, which is my main application of interest right now, um, people use various technology to measure connectivity between different locations in the brain, and that gives you a network. Um, you can study transportation networks where uh, edges of flights between airports, something like that. In social sciences, people study not just humans, but relationships between bigger entities. You can study relationships between countries, such as trade or conflicts or treaties and so on. So um, these things are very commonly analyzed in different fields. Um, I'm going to show you this one example, which I dug out of, a, um, of an old talk. Um, it's not about this topic at all, but I had to use this one because this is Jesus's Facebook friends. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for still letting me um, keep that figure. Of course, it doesn't have his Texas A&M friends, so it's much bigger now. Um, but this is, a, this is an example. This is what a network might look like when you visualize it. Keep in mind that these pictures come straight from, straight from our heads, right? These coordinates on the plane is something we impute. We just know that the things are connected. We don't know that some of them are closed together. Some of them are colored in different colors, clustered, and so on. That's output of algorithms. But you might see something like that. Um, so how do we represent data like that? The very basic unit that we work with is an adjacency matrix. We have n objects. Their relationships are recorded in the n by n matrix. The simplest scenario is when you just have zeros or ones, connected, not connected. Um, if there's no direction to the edge, this network will be um, symmetric. It's called undirected network. So you have a symmetric binary matrix. Um, you can debate whether you want to allow self loops or not and enforce zeros in the diagonal or not enforce, depends on the context. Uh, but fortunately, it doesn't matter for analysis. The diagonal is negligible compared to other parts, so I'm just not even going to worry about salt loops. So here is a tiny little example where when you have a network like this, you have these connections, you can record them in a matrix like that. It will be zeros and ones, and you, know, you might want to ask, what can you say about this? So um, being statisticians, um, we analyze things through random models, um, something probabilistic. There has been a lot of work on networks outside of statistics by physicists and computer scientists. They do it differently. But we want to think about randomness and hopefully um, infer something. So if we have binary edges, of course, there's about one choice of distribution you can use for that, which would be the Bernoulli distribution. It tells you everything. Um, if you have weighted edges, which say in my neuroimaging application, they have to be weighted, um, doesn't work any other way, then you can use another distribution if you want for modeling. And then um, still a whole lot of the literature relies on the independent edges assumption for the purpose of modeling. Um, that doesn't mean we believe that it's actually true, but for the purpose of writing likelihoods and things like that, people use that quite a lot. And I'm going to stick to this assumption for this talk. Now, if you have a binary matrix, um, what can you possibly know about it? The probability of an edge, right? That determines the distribution. So if for each entry, you know the probability that it'll give you a one, then you know everything about your model under the independence assumption. And you can immediately see that if you just observe this one matrix and each entry is a Bernoulli random variable and they're all different, there's nothing you can estimate. Because for each edge either happened or didn't happen, you have a sample size of one. So if you're going to infer anything about this thing, you need to make structural assumptions on P. There has to be some information sharing across all these edges. 
Um, and you hope there is, right? In real data, there should be, otherwise they wouldn't all be in the same network. So that is what enables analysis of network data is structural assumptions. And people have made many, many different kinds and built many different models. One of the most common um, assumptions that you might have seen in network talks is communities, um, where you assume that it's basically a cluster structure. And then you often think of the probability matrix as being block constant. Each community does the same thing. More generally, you can assume this matrix is low rank. That also gives you some sharing of information. Block constant matrix is low rank, but low rank is more general. There's a whole different line of work assuming smoothness under some suitable arrangement of nodes. What I'm going to focus on today is latent variable models. That's a fairly general class of models. It does include um, a lot of the low rank and communities models as special cases. So it's a bit more general. And this is just saying there's some latent variable associated with each node. We don't observe it. We don't know what it is. But the probability of an edge is a function of the latent variables of the two nodes that form this edge. And then there's another um, class of models I just want to mention due to Peter Hoff and his authors developed over the years, which take both latent and observed features together as, as input. I'm just going to stick to latent features because I just observed the network for this book. So the general principle um, on which a lot of the network analysis has been based, um, network analysis using probabilistic models, um, and there are many different models, but you usually see these two things come into play for binary edges. Um, number one is that whatever information of interest you're trying to recover, whether it's latent variables or communities or whatever it is that you want to estimate, can be recovered from the expectation. Say if the expectation is block constant, you can see the communities right away. So the model tells you that. And then the other thing that you need is concentration. You basically need to be able to say that what you observed is not too far from its expectation and therefore you can learn. it. And these two parts um, sort of serve as the foundation of 90% like of all networks papers. Um, as a bonus, this is not necessary, but it's a bonus if you can have it, is if you can have a spectral um, solution. This information of interest can be recovered from the eigenvectors somehow from the spectrum. Um, that's mainly for computational reasons. That's because it's much, much faster um, if you can do that. Um, usually, if you write likelihoods for these things, they tend to be intractable and tends to be complicated. If you can do it spectrally, then that's great. Um, and concentration of random graphs, that was, we, we wrote a review paper on this a long time ago. Um, now, um, all I want to say about that is people know how random graphs behave. And this is not me, this is the probabilists who figure that out, that's their job. Um, but it's very well known now. And as long as you have independent edges, there are results available for what's called the inhomogeneous or training model, which means every probability can be different because they don't care about inferring anything about the expectation. They just care about the distance between the expectation and the matrix. And, and basically what you know there is that if you expect a degree, so that's the total number of edges coming out from one node on average is at least log n, then you have concentration. That's what we call the dense regime. If you're below that, you don't have concentration, but you can regularize and fix it. And there are many ways to fix it. So basically this, this can be done. You need to regularize if it's sparse, but otherwise um, you can have concentration. So these things work. So with that little bit of introduction, um, I'll move on to the topic of today, um, but I'll, I'll just pause for a second in case there are questions about the setup or about networks generally. All right, so um, resampling, and I don't even know whether to call it bootstrap or resampling, but either way, but this is, this is the question that I'm thinking about. Um, I give you this one network on the left. Um, I observed it, that's all I have. I want to create a network that is like this one, but not the same, similar from the same distribution. Right? That's what Bootstrap does. You take the sample, you resample from it, you mimic the distribution. Um, well, what does it mean for a network to be similar? Right? That's a tricky question. 
And if you just look at this picture, and, you know, your first thought is, well, let me resample nodes, but then the where do they just go, right? If you resample edges, the graph will fall apart. So it's not trivial. It's like just carrying over the usual uh, bootstrap is not trivial. Why do we want to do this? Well, for all the same reasons that people want to do bootstrap in general. Um, if you believe in a population model from which this network came, you may want to do inference on some population quantities, population level properties. You may want to do inference on finite sample properties of the network. Um, say you get standard errors, confidence intervals, things like that, or things like degree distributions. You may also want to create um, multiple copies, multiple realizations from your data for other reasons, like for cross-validation. Cross-validation with a regular sample, well, we know how to do that. We split, right? We take four-fifths here, one-fifth here. How do we split a network? One-fifth of a network is not at all similar to the four-fifths. Right? So you cannot do it trivial. But you still want to do something like cross-validation, which is independent versions, independent splits for model selection purposes. And also you may want to do it under some kind of null hypothesis. You may want to do a permutation test and postulate, based on this data, I want to enforce something or other, and then resample, and how do I do that? So all the same reasons um, as in classical statistics. And of course, in classical statistics, we know how to do this. You have your distribution, you observed endpoints, and then you resample with replacement normally. Classical bootstrap takes exactly the same sample size M, but you can also look at M out of N bootstrap. There was a lot of work on that in the 80s and 90s. Um, and there are different properties. And once you get this new sample, which we'll call X star, you treat it as if that was um, a new observation. And you can do this many times, and so you, you get sample properties. And for the classical case, you have two options. I mean, you have many options, but you have two ends of the spectrum. There is parametric bootstrap, something people always knew they could do, which is assume a parametric form for this distribution. Let's say, you know, assume that this came from the normal or something. Um, this original data set, then you just fit a normal to it. So you estimate the mean and the standard deviation or whatever you need to do. And then you resample from that parametric distribution with the plug-in parameters. The non-parametric one, which is probably what you think of bootstrap as the, the usual approach is go completely the other way and just estimate the density with the empirical CDF. So just put mass one over n to, um, at every point and just resample from that. So no parametric assumption. And we know in classical bootstrap that under suitable conditions, not always, um, sometimes we wish it did, but not always, but under, in many situations, the sample properties of a sample we create this way can be used for inference. So what is the network analog of this? Well, we have a model, we have this P, we don't know anything about it yet, I haven't assumed anything, but if we're assuming binary and independent edges, we have the probability matrix that determines the thing. Um, so we can um, do the similar idea, estimate P by some P hat, and then draw a new network from that estimated P hat. Now, yeah. We only observe one network, yeah, that's the classical case. There's, there's a different setting where you observe a sample of networks. Um, in some ways it's easier, in other ways it's harder. <laughs> but um, this is the single network, so it's like so a social network, right? You just have the one social network. You don't have many copies of the same humans. <laughs> uh, one classical example, well, a common example where you have multiple networks is um, brain connectivity because then you have one brain per person and you have a sample of patients. So there you have a sample of networks, but this is all just one network. Yeah. Important clarification, thank you. So as I mentioned, you have to assume something about P in order to estimate it, um, impose some structure, otherwise you won't be able to do it. So this particular form of the latent variable model that um, 
I'm going to use here um, is called the random dot product graph. It has a latent variable model. Um, it's been around for uh, 15 years um, or so right already, but it's still a pretty active um, area of research. The idea here is um, you have these latent positions. These latent positions, unlike the network itself, are just points in some Euclidean space. Um, there is this pretty awkward um, assumption you have to make about their distribution. They're sampled ID, but they have to be coming from somewhere where the inner product will give you a probability. So it has to be supported, um, something that gives you inner products between zero and one. But once you have that, you can just model the probability of an edge as an inner product of their latent positions here. And then you just sample um, independent edges from the noise. Um, and just the notation here will be, well, right, this is a pair of A and X. A we observe, X we do not observe, X are the latent positions as RDPG model with an underlying distribution F, which is the distribution of the latent positions and the sample size F. That entirely determines the process because everything else is fixed. There are no other parameters. Um, it includes um, the stochastic block model for communities, which is what and many other variants of models with communities. Um, I won't go into that, but I'll just show you this little picture. So here are five, so for example, five points. These are their latent positions, in this case in R2. So you just see the points. This is the inner product, um, which gives you the probability matrix. So you can see, say, these two points, blue and yellow, are close together, so they have a higher probability of connecting. Um, and then once you have this probability matrix, you just get a realization of those probabilities. So, yeah. Uh, I wonder how the dimension of the latent position is. So that is something that you have to estimate, and it's basically the same problem as estimating rank, um, or you know, estimating. How many principal components are you going to take? Same kind of problem. So there are some methods. Yeah, but I'm going to treat it as known and fixed in this case. I'm not going to. Um, like with many of those things, there's usually not a lot of harm in making it a bit bigger, right? Because you just get some small eigenvalues that don't do much. So here is a, um, a fairly natural idea, I think, once you start thinking about it, is how can you do bootstrap under this latent variable model, which is, um, is go back to the latent space. We know how to do bootstrap in Euclidean spaces. Once we have points in RD, we can resample them and we don't have this problem of things falling apart. So that's what we do. We start from the observed network, that's all we have, estimate latent positions, now resample in the usual way, draw a bootstrap sample from the latent positions, get a new X star, and then generate a new network. And this I can do many times. Now, there are two versions here, um, both valid. It's not like one is wrong, one is right. It's just depending on what you want to know. You could fix the latent positions and just do this part, treating them as sort of fixed underlying parameters. Or you could estimate their distribution and resample twice, get new latent positions. We call it conditional, unconditional. I'll focus on the um, unconditional version in this talk. Um, Keith is supposed to finish his paper on the conditional version any day now. <laughs> so hopefully it'll show up. Um, so here's the roadmap. How are we going to... Um, show that this can actually be done and that this will work. Um, a fairly um, logical series of steps, if you think about it. Um, we start from estimating the latent positions, then we'll need to show that our estimates are good enough, close enough to the original. Therefore, the estimate of their distribution, the CDF is also good enough, close enough to the truth. And then we also have to show that if F is close to F hat, then Resampling from F hat will give us a network that's close to the original distribution. It's not the same thing. So that is what we do. Uh, first, we need a way to estimate, and people who work on RDPG have studied this question in great amount of detail. So we're just going to borrow their method. 
Um, they call it the adjacency spectral embedding, which uh, I just call that the SVD. <laughs> it's the same thing, which is you just take the eigenvectors and take the top, um, the top D um, eigenvectors of A and, gives you an, and that gives you an estimate. So that's one of those bonus situations where the solution can be done from the spectrum. So it's fast. Um, so you do have to estimate rank and um, you can use any of the rank estimation methods for that. And they've shown um, some properties of this. Um, and in particular, they've shown that when you estimate it in this way, just taking um, the spectral decomposition, you get, you know, your distance is bounded by something that'll go to zero. Now, there's a matrix sitting here. Um, this is any orthogonal rotation. The reason it's there is because all we ever use is inner products. The only thing that goes into the model is an inner product. So everything is actually determined up to an arbitrary rotation. Um, so there is a max of all possible rotations because you kind of have to align them. But it doesn't really matter because we never use anything other than inner products. So even if you get the wrong rotation, it doesn't matter as long as they're all the same. So um, with that, we have an estimate, and then we need to figure out how to measure the distance between network distributions, for which we're going to use a couple of ingredients. The first ingredient will be just the distance between two adjacency matrices. How do you measure distance between two adjacency matrices? The nodes are unlabeled. So I can rotate the nodes, I can apply any permutation, it'll be the same graph, right? The graph is the same. So it wouldn't be a good idea to just take a matrix distance to take like a Frobenius norm of, norm of the difference or something because there's the permutation. So the way the graph matching distance is defined is exactly taking that into account. So you look at the differences between your two matrices, but you have to take the best possible alignment. So over all possible permutations, and this is just normalized. So this is called the graph matching distance. And just to give you an example of how this works, um, how build some intuition. Well, we can we don't need to normalize or anything, but um, how many ways are these two graphs different? You can see if you can try and count it in your head. So there are um, seven vertices. Some edges match, some edges do not match. How many edges are present in one but not the other? Anybody see? One or two? Two. On each side. <laughs> so four. Once they are highlighted, you can see that with this alignment of vertices, right, there the edges um, shown in red are unique to, to their own graph. So if I just take the difference between these two matrices and they're all binary, I'm not gonna write them out. Um, they're symmetric, there will be four differences of one, right? And because there are four edges, and so I'll get, from the symmetry, I'll get two. So that will be the distance. That's without any permutation of nodes. But then you have to ask yourself, can I permute the colors of these vertices? Can I make these graphs look more like each other is there a better permutation that will give me a smaller distance? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to do that in their head. Um, um, I, I have to say that I managed and really surprised both myself and Keith <laughs> by doing that, but, but I think that was a fluke. I don't think it's, <laughs> it's easy to do. So I'll, I'll show you the solution. If you reorder it this way, um, oops, I'm using, P instead of pi, but it is the same permutation matrix. You get the idea. So um, with this reordering, it's the same graph. Um, the colors have been changed. And now um, I actually don't, don't have as many different ones. Um, so, so that's kind of the idea. Yeah. Uh, 
Calculating the distance, maybe, uh, yeah, you don't you don't search um, through all possible permutations. People have algorithms for calculating the graph matching distance. That's true. It is it is not an easy computation. We fortunately do not ever need to actually calculate it. <laughs> we just need to show that it's controlled. <laughs> uh, but yes, absolutely. So um, so then we have that just for two matrices and then the other ingredient we need for our distribution distance on networks is the Wasserstein distance which you may have seen just for two distributions in Euclidean spaces on RD so that's just the normal Wasserstein distance which is also goes by the name Mallers distance and earth movers distance and a few others and it's been very popular recently in the optimal transport and various other problems so what this does is um, you look at just the regular distance, I mean, and you can put L2, L1 or whatever you want in there, it doesn't matter. Um, but let's just say this is the regular Euclidean norm. The difference between these two variables, they're multivariate, so they're vectors. This is a number, so you can integrate. Um, and what you do is you take the minimum possible value of this over all joint distributions that have the fixed marginals. So the marginals have to match F0 and F1, and then the joint can be anything, and you take the best possible alignment. So it's kind of like the same idea as the, with the permutation. So putting those two things together, we basically um, can define the same thing for network distributions. We'll call it um, Wasserstein graph matching distance, which um, we'll just say we'll again take um, the best possible alignment over all the possible joints with the fixed marginals and we'll use we'll integrate the graph matching distance instead of say the euclidean distance in here and this is a distance this is an actual distance so um the key proposition here um which which is really keith's work is um connecting the graph matching distance between network distributions to the Wasserstein distance between the underlying distributions of latent variables, which happens to be connected with a really nice simple factor of two. Um, you can actually make this bound better by putting various ugly things here, but I think two, two is good enough. <laughs> um, and, and it's a coupling based proof, which I'm not going to talk about, but that basically tells you if you can get these two distributions close enough in regular Wasserstein distance, then the resulting network distributions will also be close. And so from there, um, basically this bootstrap follows putting these things together. Um, if you have data from the random dot product graph model and you've estimated by the adjacency spectral embedding, which is just the leading eigenvectors, and then do what I described, resample latent positions without replacement in the usual bootstrap, and draw new networks, you have this convergence and distribution between your bootstrap distribution of adjacency matrices and the truth. Um, I just want to acknowledge that Jing Lei had a somewhat related result for a different purpose in a different metric and for a different model, <laughs> but um, it's sort of like, it has the same spirit. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Questions at this point? Since many things uh, are centered around the latent position, what are some of the concrete examples, for example, the case of uh, Facebook? And also, two reasonable people who take the same kind of latent position or well, you learn them from data, right? So um, one common example for something like Facebook is communities, right? Are you, you know, politically on the left, politically on the right? Um, are you, you know, did you go to high school in this town or that town? Those things come out in the eigenvectors quite clearly. Um, some of them by nature are discrete. Right, high school is discrete, but other things may be continuous. Um, so it really depends on, on the application. Um, I have a student who is working on this kind of trade data between countries, um, and you get these embeddings. You know, countries make sense to put on the plane, right? Do the first approximation, we're on the plane. And uh, what comes out of it are 
both geography, so you know, you see things like you know, European countries are close together, but also not just geography, but actual trading relationships. Like you know, there's if you look at the trade in wine, then you see, you know, South America and Australia and New Zealand showing up as, as very important points. And if you look at the trade in chocolate, then Switzerland, you know, things like that. So, you know, kind of like think about it as PCA, same, same kind of idea. Yeah. So the different positions yeah. are perhaps not unique. I mean, they are. They're not unique. So, uh, so then, um, like, how do you, um, how do you incorporate it in the, the research? Well, so, um, so it's they're not unique uh, in a very particular way. They're not unique up to an orthogonal transformation, so up to a rotation. So you can just take any arbitrary rotation um, and resample just as long as you fix it and resample from this fixed rotation, because then you will always be taking in our products to generate the network and it will always cancel. So as long as it's not changing, that's, um, that's okay. Yes. I'm wondering if you have any defined distributions in the network. Uh, you would have also done that based on the, some distance between the latent positions. Well, so, I mean, that's basically what it's saying, right? That, um, I can convert it to the distribution, but um, you you could. The the thing is that, I mean, first of all, you don't observe them, <laughs> right? Um, but second, it's also that you know the distributionally, yes, the latent position determine everything, but you can still have many different networks resulting from the exact same latent positions, right? Because there's still randomness, you still flip the edges, so you sort of want to have a measure that actually takes the network. Yes. I have a question about the dimension. So I know the dimension is fixed, and I assume the result is assuming that it's the true dimension. But do you have any idea what happens if, let's say, the dimension is five, but you resample only four, as far as the distance control on the network versus the position? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the result applies if D is um, true. And empirically, we looked at this. What happens and um, there's really not a lot of um, price you pay for taking a bigger D. If you have a smaller D, then things would start breaking. Um, and you'll add a little bit of noise by, by taking more dimensions. Um, but you know that, that goes with the small eigenvalues, so it doesn't matter too much. But yeah, theoretically, this is the correct D. Yeah. Yes. Just a follow-up question. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, you have node specific covariates also. Uh, will the same uh, have been different? Very good question. So we haven't done that. I would think that um, it should go through because it's easier. Node specific covariates you observe. You don't have to estimate them, so you don't even have to bound that. Um, but the models, so like Peter Hoff's models that use both latent positions and um, and this kind of thing, they're very difficult to fit. They have to be done by MCMC because they, they don't get this nice spectral thing. And so just computationally, um, it's, it's an extra burden, but I think in terms of just convergence of the bootstrap distribution, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't hold if you just add more things that you observe. Okay, well, let me move on. Just one quick example. Um, I'm not gonna show you a lot of um, simulations, but just one. Um, this is the kind of um, network statistic that people often estimate and compare in applications. Um, this is the average shortest path distance. So for all pairs of nodes, and there are algorithms for computing this, for all pairs of nodes, you find the shortest path distance through the graph between them, um, and you average across the whole set of pairs, and um, you try to get some idea of the distribution. So um, here you see, um, this is just the density of the thing. I mean, of course, it will be random, right? You generate a new network, you get something else every time. So these are all sampled from, um, an RDPG with 50 nodes. Um, and um, the true distribution is this weird thing, the purple curve. So it's not anything nice. Um, it wouldn't be, 
necessarily the best idea to fit it with a normal something like that and do parametric bootstrap for this. Um, and then the curves that you see, um, so um, the blue one, this is, look at this color, the sort of turquoise one, um, that is our method. This is doing this non-parametric resampling, estimating um, latent positions resampling from them. Uh, we have a parametric version, the green one, because it's a simulation, we actually know what the district, there was some sort of beta distribution that we did for um, the latent positions. So we say, okay, we know it's a beta distribution, so we just fit that parametrically, we still estimate parameters. Um, that doesn't seem to be particularly advantageous. They are not the same, but I can't easily say one is necessarily better than the other. Neither one's perfect. Um, but then um, there's this other approach, um, which is resampling vertices directly. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, which doesn't take into account latent positions at all. And you can see that that, that ends up being quite a bit off. Um, and it's still not terrible, but definitely more often than the ones. And these are the corresponding confidence intervals um, as a function of the size of the graph. So you can see that, of course, uncertainty goes down because the dimension is fixed. He has to make the distribution better and better. And again, you get slightly narrower ones um, from this um, non parametric bootstrap. So there are some advantages, clearly, but there are also drawbacks, like with everything. Um, First of all, each bootstrap replica that I have to generate is an n by n matrix. And I need many of them. If n is large, this is a pain. Um, also, if we just maybe want to estimate a functional, so like the shortest path distance or something like that, maybe we don't need the whole network. Maybe we can do it in some more efficient way. Um, and also the convergence in the Wasserstein distance that we use doesn't necessarily imply convergence for every possible functional. You have to see what the functional is. Um, so there is related line of work, not not mine, um, that kind of tries to um, to do this on a smaller scale, but it only really works for a particular type of resampling. This is for resampling subgraphs. Subgraphs are like little patterns like this, so individual edges, triangles, or you know little other patterns. You can think of them as network moments, quote unquote. Um, they kind of have, play the same role. If you compute expectations of all these things, they're like moments and you can do a method of moments and fit a model. And most prior work on um, network bootstrap um, actually um, focused a lot on this because if you just worried about some functional that has to do with this, you never have to stitch the network back together. You're just counting triangles, just sample random triangles from across the place. You never have to put them back together. You compute your functional and, and, and you can do this. Um, generally, it scales like n to the order of m, depending on how many vertices you use. So you can't do this for very big subgraphs easily. But if you're just doing these little things like that, it actually works quite well. You still have to do it big times. Um, what we um, did here is we um, generalized this a little bit. Um, just one special case where we can simplify our general methods for latent variable models to bootstrapping U statistics. It's another thing from a long time ago. Um, I'll remind you of what a U statistic is. It's any statistic that can be written in the form of this sum. Um, so you, you take a function, um, that's the function is called the kernel. This function has to be symmetric in its arguments. Like one simple example is the mean. The mean just has one argument, right? That's a U statistic. Um, the second moment, and, and so on. Um, and this was um, a, a very nice paper, a recent one, where they worked out that if you want to do bootstrap for use statistics, you actually never have to resample the x's at all. Um, you don't have to recompute these things. All, all you need to do is deter the weights. So the randomness comes from the weights. So instead of taking the sum, you can properly selected random weights can be substituted here. You draw them many times, you recompute this and you get a proper bootstrap. So for networks, that's nice because I don't need to construct all these matrices. 
And um, so what we showed is that we can do the same exact thing for any network statistic, which, which can be written as a use statistic of latent positions. So subgraph counts are included in there, degree distribution, and, and so on. Um, and again, um, sort of using um, the previous theory, we can show that the distribution will approximate the correct thing. And if you do this trick on use statistics, you gain a little bit here. You don't have to do it B times because all your bootstrap replication is just in the weights. So this part you still have to do, you still have to compute your moments, but then B sits there separately just for the weights. So um, I have what, about five minutes, right? Five, seven minutes left. Um, I want to briefly tell you about um, another line of bootstrap um, that we've been thinking about um, much harder um, in terms of theory. So no theory for this one, um, but this is something that people actually do um, in practice. And um, this is going fully non-parametric because um, the latent variable approach, well, it's kind of neither, right? It's not fully non-parametric because I assume the RDPG model, which not everybody likes, not everybody wants to believe that their network is an RDPG. Um, but it's also not fully parametric because I did do an empirical CDF of the latent positions. I didn't fit any parametric distribution there. So it's something in between. What if we don't want to assume anything and we just want to try to resample directly? So go back to this question. Can we draw nodes? Can we draw edges? And, and in fact, people have looked at this and there are multiple strategies. Um, the most common one is what's called node sampling, um, which is just what it sounds like. You select a subset of the nodes and then you just look at the edges that go with them. So that's the induced subgraph. It's a smaller network, but some things carry over some things you can learn. Um, another version of that is row sampling. This was used, for example, in this network cross-validation paper by Chen and Lei, uh, where you again select a set of nodes, but instead of looking at the induced subgraph, you say, I observe all the edges from those nodes to the whole network, not just to each other. That's row sampling. And you can think of that as sampling rows of the adjacency matrix. And finally, you can do node pair sampling, which is um, something we have used for um, edge cross-validation also in networks, which is you select a subset of pairs. And let me show you a picture, which will hopefully make it clearer. So the first one is node sampling. So I just observe this red part of the adjacency matrix. The second one's row sampling. Because of symmetry, I get this L-shaped thing, but really I just selected these rows and observed everything in those rows. And node pairs is just random entries um, without any pattern. And these entries may be ones or zeros. So I'm not just sampling edges. I'm just sampling entries and recording whatever was there, whether it was a zero or not. Now, once you look at this picture, it's immediately clear, like it's natural to think about it, what fraction are you sampling? That's the P, um, but you're sampling different objects. So what you really want to look at is what fraction of this matrix is colored in red. That's what's comparable. So if you're sampling P nodes, that'll be P squared here, and you know this, whatever it is here, and for the node pairs, it's just P. So that's what we're, we're, I'm gonna call it Q. And so that is going to be comparable across all schemes. That's the fraction of the matrix that um, I allow myself to observe. Um, and if you're gonna do this, you may want to ask yourself a number of questions. With or without replacement is a the really easy one. Clearly, you have to do it without because with replacement, you just don't gain anything. Um, but all the other ones are hard. Um, how do you choose Q? What effect does it have? Which type of resampling should you do? Should you do nodes or pairs or whatever? And does it matter for different tasks? Should you do different things for different tasks? So I don't have answers to all of these questions. I actually hardly have any answers to any of them. But we do have one algorithm that we proposed for selecting the sampling fraction Q. And, and the first thing that we did observe empirically is that very much matters. Um, it, it's not really um, something you can just set to be like 0.5 and, and hope everything will come together. Um, the, the method that we did was inspired by something done a long time ago by Peter Hall called iterated bootstrap 
but it's not quite the same because we have a network, but this was kind of the, the inspiration. Um, so I'll just quickly tell you what it does. Um, I'll, I'll describe it for confidence intervals, but you can sort of do it for whatever else you're getting out of your bootstrap. So if your goal is a confidence interval, what you do basically is um, you fix a function, you split your nodes, so you split your network into half, two halves. Um, you compute these confidence intervals on um, doing the resampling schemes on both sides. And then you get a confidence interval from one side and the empirical estimate from the other, and you see the coverage. So this is, of course, very computationally intensive. That's iterated bootstrap. So it's like a double bootstrap. You have to do it twice. Um, and then you pick the one that gives you the best alignment, but it does work quite nicely, we found, um, at least for um, the things that we tried, which are still local. So like for normalized triangle density. I, I won't go into the details of the simulation. Um, but I'll just, and this is still a work in progress, um, that paper is not finished, but um, some intermediate conclusions are that the choice of Q matters um, and the choice of the sampling scheme also matters. Um, this algorithm that we have can be used, but it's computationally expensive. So maybe we can do something better. Um, as soon as you do subsampling, any kind of subsampling um, on a network, your number of nodes and edges is changing. We cannot uh, preserve sample size. So it's never going to be N out of N bootstrap. It's going to be M out of N bootstrap, which requires rescaling. Um, it can be done, but you just have to keep an eye on that. Um, in terms of what works when, just empirically, it makes sense. What we're seeing is that node sampling tends to fail on small graphs. If you don't have a lot of nodes, then sampling nodes, you know, just not, not enough information. And node pair um, sampling tends to fail on sparse graphs for the same reason. If you don't have a lot of edges, you choose a lot of pairs, you'll just end up with a bunch of zeros. It's not going to be very important. And um, there are already some established guarantees um, well, not sampling done by other people for certain parameters, but not really much for others. So to summarize, um, with sampling from an estimated distribution of the um, network that you get from the observed adjacency matrix gives you potentially a whole span of solutions from parametric to non-parametric, at least largely non-parametric. Um, if you really don't want to make any assumptions like the latent variable models, you can do the subsampling, which people um, do in practice, but there are not many guarantees that it's actually doing correct bootstrap at this point. Um, one big advantage of resampling from an estimated p hat is that you can then match the um, size and say other things like degree, because you can generate exactly an n by n adjacency matrix. And computational costs vary. Um, of course, no bootstrap is ever going to be computationally cheap, but depending on the statistic of interest and the method of estimating P, you can do this in reasonable ways or it can become really expensive. Among the things that I'd like to see uh, going forward, either in our, my group's work or other people's, um, are these kinds of methods with fewer assumptions in P, less strict modeling assumptions, larger classes of statistics of interest, not just network moments, um, understanding the trade-offs between various assumptions, that's always the case, and also computational improvements. And I'll stop here.